Welcome everyone to the next round of AMPC webinars. We will be starting to roll out webinars um, on a roughly fortnightly basis moving forward, just to make sure that we're keeping that connection with industry and um, presenting on a number of the initiatives that um, AMPC have been working with with industry. So today, we're lucky enough to have Des Bola um, here, who is one of the experts around meat messaging. And Des has been working in industry for a long time, working with information systems within the meat and livestock industry. Um, he's the Director of Management of Technologies. And Des works with a lot of companies across the supply chain to ensure effective means of traceability. And through his work, he has also presented um, at a number of forums globally. So we're very lucky to have Des uh, join us today. We've also got with us Stacey McKenna from AMIC. And Stacey is going to give us a bit of a background into um, why meat messaging is so important uh, and you know the reasons why your company should be starting to consider all the aspects around meat messaging. So for those of you that are new to um, the AMPC platform, or then the go-to webinar, we really encourage questions to happen throughout the uh, event. It is being recorded, so we will send out the recording afterwards and it will be on the AMPC YouTube um, channel as well. If you do have a question, there is a little question tab that you can um, type in your question and then later during the session, Matt O'Brien, who is our Senior Program Manager at AMPC, will be asking Stacey and Des all the really hard questions that um, you, you put forward. So without sort of further ado, Stacey, I'll hand over to you to give a bit of background introduction. Yep, great, thanks Amanda. Um, firstly, thanks to AMPC for hosting today's webinar and Des for getting involved to present the benefits of meat messaging to it. So this webinar has come about in response to recent communications from both MLA and the Department of Agriculture that manual, sorry, manual remarking services will be ceasing in the USA from the 30th of November this year. So the Australian government currently provides remarking services on the west coast of the USA through Austrade, and MLA provides those services on the east coast. Um, those, these manual remarking services, they're not provided in any other market or to the best of our knowledge through any other government for other countries. So we've probably been quite lucky to have this up until this point. Uh, back in 2016, FSIS issued a notice regarding using barcodes to verify eligibility of imported products with missing or completely illegible shipping marks. So this allows barcodes to verify the eligibility of imported products with missing shipping marks without having to have that person in place to make those changes. Um, so Make Messaging is a system that can pick up those capabilities if the correct systems are utilised and the procedures are followed, shipping marks can be reapplied without the need for a representative to be on site. So this is particularly important at the moment during COVID when businesses are looking to reduce on-site visitors. That's obviously both in Australia and in the USA. So more recently, there've been further meat notices and FSIS directives that have supported the use of meat messaging to manage shipping marks for products into the USA and the Red Meat Supply Chain Committee have been working on these notices and communications to ensure that industries across what needs to happen here to be able to use the system. So the first of these communications is the webinar today that Des is going to lead us through very shortly. And we've also been working on a range of industry circulars. The first of those went out on the, um, sorry, in Amex Prime Cups edition yesterday, and Amanda is also going to send that out to the group who's online today. They'll be released fortnightly and they'll go into a little bit more detail about what mate messaging can do. So thanks again for attending and I'll hand over to you, Des. Thank you, Stacey. Um, and thank you, uh, Matt and Amanda. Uh, Stacey spelt out a bit of what this is all about and why. But we'll go into a bit more detail and, and talk about what it'll mean to you. Now, as uh, Amanda has said, if you have questions, raise them. Now, we'll answer them as best we can as we move forward, but we want them related to the issue we're saying. So raise them as you see the issue, and then uh, Matt's going to uh, raise them with me and we'll respond through the session. 
Okay, what is meat messaging? The easiest way to think about it is a filing cabinet in the cloud. We're all talking about storing stuff in the cloud, all the technology, all the things that go with it. So we think about it as a filing cabinet. Now, when we talk about export consignments, so shipments to the US or any other country, the health certificate number is the index for our filing cabinet. So if that makes sense, we have a health certificate for these export shipments. It has a health certificate number on it. Now that health certificate has a quantity of information on it. We know the port of loading, we know the shipping container, other relevant information about the consignment. In the consignment, we have the cartons. The carton labels tell us the product description. Is this organic? Is this uh, halal? A whole pile of information about a product is shown on the carton labels. On the carton label there are also the individual barcodes. So if we think of our filing cabinet in the sky, we actually have a list of all the barcodes, descriptions from the carton labels, and the information from the health certificate, all indexed using the health certificate number. So conceptually, it's very simple. Now, who uses it? See, this is the flip side of this. We've got our filing cabinet. Now we're looking at who's putting stuff up there. So it's an industry tool. So it's industry's filing cabinet in the cloud. It's operated, it was done as a red meat industry project. And it relates to export consignments for this discussion. And exporters upload the consignment information. Now, most of you use XDoc, that's moving data. Meat messaging is just, as I said, filing cabinet. We've talked the details. XDoc talks about the authorization and basically the confirmation of the product is suitable for the export markets it's going into. Meat messaging is the detail. It's the carton description. It's all the individual carton barcodes. So exporters use it to load the information up into the cloud. Inspection houses in the US can use it under the directive 99,000.5, uh, uh, version B's out now. They use it to verify that the cartons that are sitting in the loading bay, as they've un unloaded a container, sitting there are the cartons that relate to that health certificate. They do that using the barcodes. So the inspection houses can use a little app, scan a barcode, any barcode on any carton, and it'll come up and say, there's the 700 cartons that are part of the shipment. This is the health certificate belongs to. All of that information is brought up in a report, and we'll see that report soon. End users. We also have end users using the system who are the ones who actually receive the carton to be able to scan it and electronically get things like slaughter date, processing date, the carton serial numbers, all that information about the product is able to be used by end users. Government officials can also access it. They can see what is or isn't in a consignment. They can see the, the products that are moving. They need to do that as part of that verification and validation process. So FSIS are happy that meet messaging meets the requirements of the directive. It has to have government supervision of the system. The government has to be able to access and see what's happening inside of it to ensure that there is robustness. It is an industry program. It must be robust. It must be supported by government or the FSIS to recognize it. Okay. Now it's an interesting little question this, why are we doing this? And the answer is because in the US, when you send product over there, if you leave off the shipping mark, the products are rejected. There's a number of other reasons you can get refusals, damaged product, incorrect paperwork, there's a whole list and, and I have that list. One of the things Meet Messaging does is it collects all that information that's published by the FSIS. It is public information if you know where to get it. And it counts. So this little report here in front of us shows the worst 80 exporters. 
Now, I don't know who they are. There's just a ranking, 1 to 80. But the worst one has had 313 rejections for the year. Now, they might not know about all of these, but the FSIS records refusals based on the establishment number stamped on the box. So that's an interesting point. So you may have sold the product, it may have been handled by a third party, but the FSIS records the rejection against the establishment number on the box. Now, right now, you can log into Meet Messaging and actually see your list of rejections that have happened. So each company that's registered from Meet Messaging actually has access, and when they click on their rejections, they can actually see their list of rejections um, going back one, two, three, four years. The date, the number of cartons, the total count at the, after recertification or steps to reject, uh, remove the rejections. So there's a lot of information floating around in Meet Messaging if you want to access it. It's a very valuable tool to start to say, oh, I am seeing rejections here. I didn't know about this. Maybe we should look into this. Why are they happening? And then we can look at using Meet Messaging to help reduce the number of rejections. What's that mean overall for the industry? Now, this is the data from January 16 to December 2020. Uh, FSI is published every couple of months, so we're always a couple of months behind in terms of the overall volume. But in that period, 39,000 rejections with a total refuse weight, so that's after we've tried to fix all the problems up, total refuse weight of 1.3 million kgs of Australian product of uh, red meat has been refused entry into the US. That's a fairly interesting set of numbers. We need to sort of keep working on that. Okay, why now? Now, Stacey very much highlighted a bit of why now. Meat messaging has been, you know, we basically started about 25 years ago, or even a bit longer, in working with government, both here in Australia and in the US, at an industry level, to build a solution where we can use the barcodes on the cartons as the identifier of the carton. And the whole rationale behind that was the concept of shipping marks are very, very old, long before barcodes. Now we barcode all our products to manage them and the logistics levels all the way through the supply chain. So why aren't we using the barcode as a representation of the equivalent of the shipping mark? Now people within FSIS think this is good. Operationally, it means there's a lot of work to do. And as Stacy said, more than five years ago, in 2016, or well, five years ago, um, they issued the uh, notice and it's been uh, the uh, changed to a notice to a directive and then the directive has been reissued with some amendments. So this is not new, but we have had some level of urgency applied to us. Now we said the 30th of November this year. Now in a meeting the other day, some of our industry people quite rightly said, well, if you're putting product on the water, that means by September you're doing this. Now, between now and September is not a long time. We need to think about how we're going to get this done. Yes, we have a, yes. a question from the previous slide around NP. Uh, can an NPEC rejections or only processing of and packing establishments? Excellent. The non-packer exporters can be registered and the non-packer exporters, we can put a process in place to allow product that relates to them related to the um, establishment because that establishment that they might be using may in fact be servicing themselves and many other companies. So, you know, you can't see their product, but the NPEs can um, access the product that relates to them. So there is a way they can do it. However, as I said, um, the NPE may have done nothing wrong, but didn't actually touch the product. But the last um, organisation who actually saw it, stamped it and put it in the container may have been the one that made the mistake, but the NPE will be the one that may suffer the financial burden. But it will be the establishment number that will be um, marked as a rejection notice. So it's a bit of a convoluted, but an answer to the question, yes. Okay, let's keep moving. Remarking can be managed directly by the Iron House. Now, this is what Stacey alluded to. Watching this in use is pretty amazing. 
So those that are, you know, Mullica Hill and a number of other places that have been using this, when the products come through and whoopsie, there's a shipping mark missed, they literally, um, you know, simplistic system, they get one of the barcodes, they get into meet messaging with that barcode, they print out a sheet, which is a, what's called a um, barcode verification report, which lists the information of the health certificate and then all the cartons. And they highlight the ones that are missing the shipping mark. Stick it in front of the FSIS inspector. He looks at the carton, looks at the barcodes, looks at the list, see they're highlighted, says done, and it's finished. Takes that long to fix the problem. It really is efficient when we follow it. So this is the why now. We started 25 years ago. More than five years we've been able to do this. Industry, MLA have been saying for the last couple of years they're going to stop this. It, the rubber has now met the road and we now have to action this. Okay. Now, as we said, it's actually an FSIS directive. Now, it's part um, 7 E procedures for correcting shipping mark. So basically what it allows is it says, if it's incorrect, then by using the barcodes, you can do it. That's as simple as that. And it was great when we were working with FSIS, they were more than happy with this. As long as the government, the Australian government, had an eye on top of meat messaging, keeping a look, making sure everything's doing what it's supposed to, it's not just free for all, then FSIS went, you got control of it, you can demonstrate it, and they added it in. So it's quite amazing we achieved that. It's used by the importing establishments, as we said. Now, in the FSIS, it's only countries that have actually done this work that can use it. Now, other countries are looking going, well, can we play too? Now, New Zealand has a model in place. So it's a bit more complex. And we have effort, and we have uh, meet messaging. Every other country is watching saying, how can we do this? So today it's a commercial advantage. It won't be for long because everyone else is going to play this game too. But FSIS will only approve it on a country by country basis. They will also only approve one system per country. Okay, this is a nice diagram. This is an MLA diagram. Now, why am I showing you this? Because this was presented by uh, uh, Rob Williams from MLA last year uh, on a NEMI uh, workshop. And you can see here where he actually talks about the different livestock systems we have in Australia. We have the livestock, you know, the NLAS, we have the NVDs, the supervision through slaughter, um, through boning. We talk about the GS1 system. We talk about meat messaging. Again, Australian government keeping an eye on thing, certifications going through, and the product being distributed. So we talk about meat messaging as one of the steps that the Australian industry system uses along its supply chain. That at import, we have a container. You now the container's moved around the world. When it arrives for inspection, we've got the inspection house doing all its tests, temperature, all the rest of the things, paperwork, and then they start to check. And this is when Meat Messaging provides a tool to let them verify that all the cartons in the container are the ones that are supposed to be in there, are the 700, are part of the load. And they use the GS1 barcode from the carton through Meat Messaging to get all the details. So you can see that we see this as part of the supply chain. It's not a tack on. It is part of the meat supply chain uh, through the export channels. Now, I keep harping on this fact that meat messaging is an industry program. It has to be. If every man and his dog went out and built their own system, the FSIS said, we can't manage that. Now, we do that with XDOC. XDOC is a system. We don't have 50 different X stocks. We have X stock. It's a government system, photosanitary certificate system. Meat messaging is an industry system that handles the details. It's administered by Osmeet. It's got to belong to somewhere. It's administered by Osmeet as an industry program. It has a committee 
comprising OSME, DWA, uh, AMPC, AMEC, MLA, and a whole pile of others, and industry individuals representing different organisations to ensure that the MEET messaging system is focused on delivering the outcomes of industry. It's important to be an industry system, otherwise we could get commercial implications getting in the way, we could get individual vested interests getting in the way. It has to be an industry system. It manages export consignments, this is today's discussion, because we now need to make this happen. It handles EMTCs, because everyone hates paper MTCs. And it handles something called domestication of loads. But that was something that appeared several years ago um, to keep track of all the movements, because when an export establishment makes a product, it's either going to leave the country, it's going to go to another export establishment, or it's going to go into the domestic channels. And once it enters the domestic channels, it's never going back out into the export. So that's why Meat Messaging handles those three classes of consignments when product leaves. It's recognised by governments. Yes. Oh, we've got another question. Excellent. Love questions. Yep, you do. Do all eye houses currently being used by Australian exporters have the technology in place to effectively use the Meat Messaging system? If not, what percentage do? And that's from Simon Linky. Excellent. Now, it's an excellent question. Technology to do it, yes. Have they gone through the training? Uh, over the last four years, we've been running workshops over there. We ran it with NEMI. We've ran, ran it with uh, American Import um, Import Council of America. Um, we've run these workshops with uh, importers to go through that. Um, Technology is not a problem because, as I said, they can either do it quite cleverly with and integrate it into their system. Um, yeah, the the uh, some of the organisations over there are doing that. Others, literally, there's an app you get on your phone and you scan a barcode and you get a PDF of all the uh, cartons in the consignment. It has to be a low-tech solution because if it's a high-tech solution from the iHouse, it's not going to work. Now, I had one iHouse this morning uh, contact me. Um, so they had a company who was using Meet Messaging send some products through their iStore. Um, they went, oh, we've got these rejections, what do we do? They contacted the exporter, the exporter said, you use Meet Messaging to resolve it. Um, that came through to me through the uh, relationships in the US with different um, iHouses. Um, I've, they were registered, they've been sent their access code and, uh, and the information on how to use it. Um, we'll make sure that from our contacts in the US, they follow up tomorrow and they go through the process to get that um, uh, remarking completed. It's not hard. And as I said, it's as simple as an app that you can install on your phone. It's an exceptionally important question. We have spent a lot of effort to bring iHouses up to speed. When I'm in the US and I actually go and visit iHouses, I've got ones that are fully computer managed. They have outside facing websites that the clients can log into and see what products are currently where in their cold stores, arrange for individual products to be picked and sent to them. Magic. I walked into an ice store which had about 80 guys running around. It had about uh, 10 loading bays in and it had freezing facilities all the way through, massive facility. They ran the whole thing on an Excel spreadsheet. It was a bit scary. So what we see when we see iHouses is we see a range of exceptionally good computer skills through to not much more than a pen and paper. Meet messaging has been conceived and built to work from fully automated APIs, computers talking to computers, to you having an app downloaded on your phone and you scan a barcode and you get a PDF that you can print. It has to manage, has to cope with all those different environments. Hopefully that answered the question. Okay, recognised by government. If this was not recognised by government, we wouldn't be doing this. It's exceptionally important to realise the, the work that's been done. The Australian government, FSIS and industry collectively working on one program to achieve an outcome. And we've been doing it for 25 years and it's recognised by FSIS. That we think is a fairly amazing outcome. At a technical level, 
For all you technocrats, this is where we have a good time. You can see that little diagram there, and you can see where we talk about XDOC, eCert system, talking to PHIS, and we talk about Meet Messaging. And it then talks over in Meet Messaging in the US, and they basically match the two up. I said the key was the health certificate. Remember that. If you do not have the health certificate number to enter into Meet Messaging, it's going to be a problem. Now, I know this is a discussion we might have because sometimes that might be quite hard, especially for NPEs. But the FSIS, the inspectors there are using the health certificate. Now, there is the RFP, but I keep seeing, depending on what's happening in the US and how some of those systems run, sometimes that doesn't work so well. Sometimes it's the health certificate. Sometimes it's the RFP. Sometimes it's the container number. Sometimes it's a barcode, and that's what they use. So at the end of the day, the health certificate's the primary key. When you're uploading a message, you've got to have the health certificate to upload it. The FSIS, the inspection at the other end, could be as simple as a carton barcode. So they do, the Meet Messaging app. It's really exciting. It's a very boring app. All you do is install it and it says scan a barcode, and then it brings up the information. Now at the export establishment, this is where you're going to have to do the heavy lifting. This is the hard work. This is where you're going to have to work with your software vendors to be able to upload the consignment information to meet messaging. You as the exporters are going to have the hard work here because the information's got to be in our filing cabinet in the sky. And at the end of the day, that's going to be whatever production slash inventory software you're using has all your carton labels, has what's loading into a container, has the load um, information. It may not have all the health certificate information, might not have the health certificate number yet, but these are the issues we have to work through. It has to be with your on-plant software to make this work. You can manually do it, but it's laborious and difficult. It's far better to have it fully automated. Now, those establishments that have actually done this work and have it running, it's fairly invisible to them. All the systems happen the way they do, it gets to the end, the container's packed, sealed, loaded, they get the health certificate, they get the health certificate number, they enter that into their production management system because everything else is already in there, the voyage, the vessel, all those things, the container numbers, seal numbers, enter that in. When all the information's in, there's a send to meet messaging button and it just uploads the data, done. That is all the work it should take. If it's taking more than that, there's some workflow problems, but that's all it should take. And I'm sure there'll be a million questions about that. This is our journey, it's getting all our software vendors up to scratch with doing this and getting your work practice in place to be able to fit with it. Okay, how do we get started? There's this wonderful thing called the Meet Messaging Implementation Guide. The PowerPoint has a little click on it. So if you get access to a copy of this PowerPoint, you'll get the link to get you the implementation guide. It has all sorts of interesting stuff in there about how we go through that, what information you need, um, the structure of how the messages are done, all those sort of things. This is where you work with your software vendors. Some uh, exporters build their own systems, that's fine. Some exporters use whatever software might be Cedar Creek might be, which is, you know, might have been an old SASTIC, uh, might be um, Triton, ITP, Protrace, McCarthy, um, Exisco, uh, Emidex. There's a whole list of different software vendors out there. We are working with them whenever we get the option or ability to. We talk to them and we go, let's do this, let's do this. Now, most software vendors, when we talk to them, always say, when the client asks, we'll do. We will not do until the client asks. Now, you are the expert. Well, I have a question around that then, it is. Um, Excellent. James Strawn from the web has asked a question, and it's probably not really. I did have to drop out for a second as I didn't have any sound, but uh, will meet messaging acknowledge health certificates issued in lieu? I need to probably work through the individual organisation, uh, the uh, circumstance. I have to think about that. 
grab the details. We'll work through that one because I'll actually go through and um, work through that at CAM. Fantastic, Jane. If you could uh, send send through to myself um, uh, the, your details, and we will actually uh, 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 organise a catch up between Des and yourself, so that we can talk that one through on an individual basis. I also have another one. Can the export establishment directly upload data onto Meet Messaging? On behalf of a non-packer exporter, or does it require the non-packer exporter to upload the data on their login? Yeah, that's from Mark Love Emery. It. It's excellent. Um, the person who actually packs the container, and this is FSI is quite adamant about this. The person who actually packs the container is the one that will upload the data to Meet Messaging. Now, there's a couple of caveats on that. The FSIS, as I said, will use the export establishment number on the cartons as the reporting instance of the failure. So it's sort of going, okay, who packed the product? And it's like this company, this exporter actually made the cartons. This third party cold store packed the container. They, they're listed in Meet Messaging, so they were the ones who actually uploaded it. It says third party cold store uploaded it. It may have been uploaded for a non-packer exporter and, and they're put in as, as what we equivalently call a, a notifiable party. So they're made aware that this consignment has been uploaded and they can see all the cartons in that. And then when it gets to an uh, inspection facility, and some of these are just amazing to watch, a shipping, and I've been there and watched this, a shipping container pulls in the driveway and the staff turn around and go, do you know about this one? And they go, no, wonder who this is from. And then they get a phone call saying, I've just sent a truck over, I'm emailing you the paperwork now. Literally, I stood there and watched it. Now, that's where it can be quite tricky because then they'll get the container and start to put the bits of jigsaw together and open it, start to stage all the cartons and then suddenly go, something's wrong. Now, they have no idea who to contact. That's why they scan a barcode. And it's just gonna go, this barcode, this 700, this health certificate, and then it's going to, at best, they can start to try and figure out who's involved. Most instances, as far as FSIS is concerned, we're back to the party who made the box because that's who's listed in the US as receiving the product. Now, I'm not sure I answered that question as well as I could have, but those parties involved in the transaction can see the transaction and meet messaging. So you're talking the establishment that makes the boxes, the export listed establishment that packed the container, and the non-packer exporter that was involved in the transaction. Technically all three have some aspect of it. Often it'll only be the NPE and the third party cold store because they've picked the cartons to do the load and the original manufacturer may have nothing to do with it but FSIS will record against the original manufacturer as a fail if uh, a shipping mark is missing. Now, I know that sounds odd. It's just how they do it. Hopefully that answered the question. If it didn't, keep asking. Health certificate details is one of the keys. We have had problems with that and we need to keep working to get that right. Now, here's the other one. You need to have a GS1 membership, whoever is making the labels for the cartons. You need to have your carton barcodes matching the guidelines, the Australian Meat Industry guidelines for numbering and barcoding. Has to be a GS1 barcode, has to have the AIs on it, uh, has to have the right information because that's what FSIS are looking for. Now, why are we using GS1? Because it's global. So when I'm in the US and I'm wandering around in a cold store, 90% of the product will have a GS1 compliant label whether it's from Brazil, whether it's from Poland, whether it's from Mexico, whether it's from Canada, whether it's from Australia, whether it's from New Zealand, they have a GS1 barcode. Do they all do it perfectly? No. Do most of the Australian exporters do it well? By volume, absolutely. Okay, what does it hold and is it secure? Now, I keep harping on about this issue. The information is the stuff related to the carton and the container and the health certificate. It's logistics information. It's the stuff to allow stuff to move. 
It's what the importing country inspection houses and government representatives can see. Rule one, don't put something commercially sensitive. There is no pricing. In fact, many times there is no customer. Customer's not needed. Health certificate number's needed. Customer's not. If there is commercially sensitive information, it should not be in meat messaging. It should only be the information needed for the importing country inspection and government representatives to be able to verify the shipment. So I need the health certificate number. I need the port of loading. I need the packing establishment. I need the product description. I need all those things. You know, the vessel and the voyage. I don't need who bought it. In fact, I don't want to know who bought it. Not meaningful to me. Not needed for the clearance. Only information that will facilitate the logistics and the clearance of the product. Information and meat messaging should already be publicly available or supply chain available. Very important. If I have the carton in my hand, I have the rights to the information about the carton, especially in the US supply chain. Because at any point in time, they can go, what is this? Where was it cleared? What's going on? Because it actually says it when they stamp it on the carton, the eye house it was inspected by. So the traceability and clearance process, that information is all evident. So when we talk about what information is in meat messaging, what should either be publicly available or supply chain available? And it's accessed by end users, by the ice stores, by the logistics. It's accessed by a lot of people through PHIS. A lot of information is accessed. Having the carton in my hand, all the details on the label. I know who packed the product. It's got the AI on it. So the information that is supply chain related information is what's in there. Is it secure? It's in the cloud. So it's as secure as things are on the internet. And I read a nice government disclaimer statement the other day saying, this data is on the internet, therefore it is, is as secure as the internet. Don't put anything important there. So at the end of the day, the stuff is on the internet in a secure environment, but it's being accessed by second and third party organizations for the purpose of clearance and logistics activities. But don't upload anything that's commercially sensitive. That's a very important thing. Okay, what's that barcode scan report look like? Looks like that. So some eye house in the US scans a carton barcode, one of those many of them, and the carton barcode goes off to meet messaging and says, these are all the cartons that are about that logistics movement. So you can see the all carton serial number report. So that's what they call the verification report because it shows the information. This one, it shows buyer. This one, it shows a third party cold store that did the loadout. Often it doesn't show either of those. Sometimes it doesn't even show the consignee. All it just basically says is, it's coming from me because that's what's on the health certificate. It's got the shipping line, it's got the vessel, it's got the voyage, it's got a product description. Um, it's got all that basic information necessary for the purpose of clearance. So as long as you keep that in mind, don't put anything there you don't want to tell your end user or someone along the supply chain, then there is no problem. And it's got quite a few pages when you print this out. This could be 10 pages. Uh, and the iStores are quite happy. Print it out, walk along with Neon and go, that one, that one, that one, that one. They're the ones missing. Mr. Inspector, there it goes. There's the evidence. You happy? Yep. Okay, move forward. Magic when that happens. Okay. Needs to be a GS1 barcode. I'm sure you have all seen this a thousand times. This is the GS1 standard. This is what, it's got an old label in there, I've got to fix that. This is what a label looks like. And all the information about what a GS1 barcode, this is all your system vendor stuff. So as long as you've got a GS1 company prefix, as long as you're a GS1 member, then your system vendor will be making sure that everything is done right. And this information to them and just say, make sure it follows. Now I'm going to give you a bit of a, a teaser. Everything we've spoken to up until this point has related to explicitly the remarking. Now, as I said, meat messaging started 25 years ago. 
it started for the purpose of getting rid of shipping marks. There's a current pilot that's been running for the last uh, now uh, about 18 months working with the FSIS. And what we've been doing is we've been sending product to the US as a pallet, no pallet base, slip sheet top, slip sheet bottom, machine wrapped with a placard on it and no shipping marks. And it gets cleared as a pallet, moves to the end user as a pallet, and we don't have damage because it's got a slip sheet top, slip sheet bottom, and machine wrapped. This is our holy grail of removing the shipping marks. Now, it's only a pilot. We've got about 30 combinations of exporters, uh, inspection facilities, and end users. So FSIS want to see a lot of product go through this um, protocol to make sure it's correct. But it's moving intact all the way to the end user. It's not going to suit everybody's needs, but it's our first step after 20 years of work to be able to get product into the US without shipping marks on the individual cases. What's it look like? There's our old way. Loose cartons, each individually inspected, each individually stamped. Now, just a piece that you may not all realize, if at the time of inspection, the person doing the inspection, the stamping, which is not often the inspector, it's actually someone's been told to stamp them after the inspector's looked at them, forgets to scan, uh, stamp one of those cartons at the moment, then it is thrown away after it leaves. So we just don't have losses on arrival, refused entry. We actually have losses through the US supply chain. So even if your product cleared clearance, you could have your end user, your customer come back to you and go, I'm three cartons short. That can happen where the iHouse forgets to stamp a couple of boxes. Don't forget that, it's a pain in the neck. In our pilot, we slip sheet bottom, slip sheet top, machine wrap it and put a placard on the outside. And the placard has a code representing the uh, shipping mark and the inspector stamps the placard. And the whole pallet moves through the supply chain. It's loaded as a pallet into the container. It's pulled out as a pallet using um, forks to either grab, so grab and uh, slip sheet it out, or roller forks, and you can see some videos about that. It's inspected as a block, and it moves through to the end user as a block. Phenomenal speed through the supply chain when we do that. About five hours saving we've seen in some loads as we've watched, and, what, and no damage because the damn thing's got a top on it, a bottom on it, and machine wrapped. It's a big solid block. So it's not individual lumpers lifting boxes and dropping them onto pallets with nails sticking out. Huge benefit and no shipping mark stamps. Okay, that, that notice is continuing. This is the information we see on the placards. Some placards are like this, some placards are really small. It's how FSIF have uh, accepted it and it's working. But there are options for more people in the supply chain to join on this program. So the pallet pilot is a wonderful example of how we can work together as an industry and move towards these objectives of no shipping marks on individual cartons. Phenomenally powerful. This is the sort of stuff we have on it. Again, we can talk all techo speak what the barcodes, pallet labels, all this is the technical stuff to make it work. So now you've had a bit of a snippet, bit of an insight into where this is leading when we do this right. And all of a sudden this problem of missing or damaged shipping marks vanishes when we don't put them on. Okay, there's a whole pile of additional resources. There's the links to meet messaging, you'd register, the guide, all those bits and pieces all the GS1 stuff, the FSIS directives, so you can see all of those things. There are a lot of resources available. There's a lot of support to make this happen. AMPC are here to help you. AMIC are here to work at an industry level to make it happen. We're working with, the US, uh, with, GS, with MLA in the US. MLA in the US are working with um, uh, MICA and um, 
a nanny to train up the facilities in the US to make it happen. There's a lot of people working on this to support you. So you need to raise your hand and say, make this happen. Software vendors, workflows, loadout, we can work with all of those sections of your organization to make this work. So you want to get the benefits out of it. Thank you. And I'm sure there's some questions. I'll hand it back there, to Matt. There is, there is a question, uh, Des, and it's the one that uh, you need a or a $1 question, or whichever you, way you want to put it. Uh, is there a cost to use the meet messaging system? Um, if there is a cost, how is the inter interested party charged? That's from Simon okay. Linky again. Um, Stacey, did you want that one? I said I'd flick it to you. Um, no answer from Stacey. Is she raising her hand? Yes, I'm coming back in, Dave. Sorry, I was I was just unmuting. Can you see me? I I was just worried you're asleep. I know my presentations can be boring. No, no, not not at all. Um, happy for a joint response on this one. So currently, while this program's in the R and D phase, there's no cost to industry. However, when this was, um, well, I wouldn't say developed because it has been around for so long, but further progressed back in 2016, there was agreement from industry that this would eventually operate on a cost recovery basis. So with Ausmate running the governance and overseeing the program, that decision is still currently sitting with the Ausmate board. So when this does move from the R&D and implementation, sorry, implementation phase, through to a commercial project, there will be a cost associated. Des might be able to give you a better idea what that cost would be versus the current cost of lost products. Um, yeah, happy to do that. When I'm in the US, it's it's actually amazing to stand there. I love visiting the ice stores, love visiting places, love visiting all of them. Watching the process happen, and I talk to the guys, I go, okay, you know, the guy running the cold store, how many cartons do you end up you know, getting refused. You know, how many getting damaged? How, you know, I can see where they've had nails ripped into the bottom and I'm sort of thinking there are no wooden pallets in any of my export facilities. Where are the nails come from? And I'm watching someone over in the back corner with a hammer nailing nails back into the US pallets that are falling apart. And I actually watched one lumper one day that were having to sort something out. He ripped the bums out of 12 cartons moving them on and off the boxes. So I said to him, how many do you see? Oh, and he says, it averages about two per shipping container are lost, right? I rejected either at that point, at some step where they're damaged before they end up leaving the facility, two per shipping container. Now I know that there's not a lot of margin in meat industry. And I, when we've done the crunching of the numbers, for every carton you lose at the very end, you bought the livestock, you've processed it, you've boned it, you've packed it, you've chilled it, you've frozen it, you've packed it in container, you've done all your export, you've paid or someone's paid for the shipping to get it over there, then we throw it away. It takes about 20, the sale of 20 cartons of meat to cover the loss of a carton once we get it to the end and we're throwing two per container away. Now, here's the downside of what that question means and what Stacy just said. Let's say it was to cost a dollar, and I've just pulled that out of the air. If you're a perfect exporter and have never made a mistake, you're gonna be paying the dollar per, per shipment as insurance. As a, I've got all my paperwork, I've uploaded the message, everything's clear, if someone's made a mistake, it's covered. If you're a really skilled challenged exporter, I think I said that carefully, where the shipping marks are failing to be applied on a regular basis, and you're one of those organizations that get 100, 200 rejections a year, you win, hands down. You've covered your cost a thousand times over. So the, the whole problem with cost recovery, and we've got to have cost recovery, is those who do a perfect job end up 
um, subsidising those that have got poor practices because this system is saving your ass when it lands there and something went wrong. So no matter how you look at this, we're going to have to cover it. But as Stacey said, and as we're working with Osmeet, while it's in the rollout deployment, and the words they use is, once it moves from this R&D-E extension phase, once it moves into this is now the production norm, it has to be cost recovery. Now, it's not a government system, so it's not going to cost $10 million a year to run. But it has to be enough to cover its cost. Now, because it's an industry program, it will cost no more than the cost to run it. Hopefully that answered the question, but as Stacey and I have indicated, um, the, the decisions will be an industry decision through an awful lot of consultation through the Ausmeet board um, as Ausmeet are doing the administration. So it's like any of the programs, it's got to be funded. I'm sure there must be some hard questions. I want a nice technical question. Matt, anybody got a technical question for me? Um, I think uh, people are not asking the technical questions, but um, I think the, there's a question. Uh, is, yeah, it says, are all parity access charged? And I think that's is all everyone who's got access to it, are they charged on a parity basis? I think that's probably um, what that yeah. means. Yeah, the, the model we've always said in the, in the costings was wherever we end up with this figure, he who makes the message is the one who pays. So he who uploads the, the consignment to meet messaging um, is the one that pays the fee and everybody can read it down, down the chain. So as far as the um, inspection houses, it's an app on a phone. They just scan a carton and they get a PDF of the consignment. So technically there's no cost associated with that. We've, we've always said that those people who load the data in are the ones that are technically creating the cost, storage cost, all those things, putting it there. Um, and then those who need to access it are doing it on the bar for the people who sent it. And so there's no cost to that, that end of the, the chain. It's really, whatever the figure ends up, it'll be basically the cost to upload a message and for that message to be maintained in the filing cabinet in the sky. Yeah, cost questions okay, always uh, come up. I want operational questions. Well, the, this one is, uh, I suppose it's a very fundamental question and it's uh, from, I'd say from an, a non-packer exporter and it says, what does this new, and when we say new, we mean that it's um, probably going to be new to some, um, this messaging system mean for non-packer exporters? Um, I, I work with some non-packer exporters and, and there's some I really, really like and there's some that I'm not so fond of. Um, some, it's going to be a winner and loser for some. One of the, the dramas, and I have the same conversations when I'm in the US with brokers, there are a lot of meat brokers still in the US. Now their business is information. Their business is knowing who is buying and selling and what price points the product's at. Now, no one takes that away from them, that's their job. But one of the things that Meet Messaging does is it, it makes a bit more transparency down the supply chain. Now, when I talk to the federal government here and, and in the US and, and the various projects I keep seeing, everybody's telling me they want transparency, they want um, accountability, they want product verification, they want authenticity steps put in place. So they want all this process to make transparency along the supply chain. Now, Meet Messaging is a tool that does that merely because it's a filing cabinet in the sky that people can access the relevant logistics information. However, the flip side of that conversation is it's a filing cabinet in the sky that allows you to access the logistics information. There will be some organisations who go, I don't want that because it's created a level of transparency that's not beneficial to me. Now, why not you? That is true. But everyone is telling us, now whether it's right or wrong, that we want transparency. We want verification. We want to prove that carton came out of that container and that container came out of that establishment and that establishment has a health certificate and all that product is in fact the correct product. That means there's transparency. So technically, for a lot of non-packer exporters, this is an exceptionally powerful tool because it now gives them 
transparency. They can actually see what the cartons are that are in their containers that are going to their customers. This is great. I've got people, one pack of exporters ticking a box saying, bring it on. I've got others that are less happy about it because it is creating that level of transparency. People can see where stuff came from. People could always see where stuff came from, which is difficult. Now it's very transparent. I'm sure that's going to raise yeah. questions as well. I have an absolute bucket load of questions. I have two from Taz Davies and uh, I think they might have been technical ones and probably because we're four minutes in, if we can keep the, the if we can try and uh, have quick answers and we'll try and get through all of them. Does meet messaging handle variable length barcodes from the same establishment? Um, any GS1 compliant barcode that meets the guidelines for numbering and barcoding works in um, meet messaging. So whatever the outcome is there, we should be able to make it work. It is just saying I have to have a unique barcode per carton, uh, the GS1 standard and the guidelines for numbering and barcoding and meet does that. Okay, next one. Okay. Is there a generic work instruction available for the approved arrangement? That's from Tony uh, the, off the web. The, not as much as we probably want yet and we're happy to work with people and we have been working with people to do that. Um, the guidelines give you a lot of material to work with to head you down the path, but that approved arrangement, um, yeah, which different organisations have attacked it differently. Some of the ones I've seen have been really simple, some have been more complex, but we haven't really got a generic one, um, but the guideline will help. Okay, um, to what level will the inspection houses use this system until they decide there are too many missing shipping marks? <laughs> um, we've actually had basically half a container. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, the fact that they've got a manifest sitting there, uh, it's laborious and painful, but it works. So it, they really, it hasn't been an issue. Okay, um, and I'll ask this one as the last one. Is it a requirement of meet messaging for an NPE to be using their own range of GS1 GTINs or can they be using part of the establishment's number range? Uh, the answer is uh, either work, but I will counsel you that if you can get your manufacturer to use your company prefix on your G10, your clients at the other end will be much happier because the product says it's you. The problem is when a processing plant uses their um, company prefix on all the product they make, when the end user scans it, hence the GS1 system, it says it belongs to them, not you. So the answer is yes, it can do either, uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, now I, there, there was one other question from, from Taz, but he's, he's since left and I think you've covered it within the, um, within the presentation anyway. And I think we need, we need to catch up with him anyway to talk about thing, all things uh, meet messaging. Um, but thank you very much, Des. You've been, uh, you know, a wealth of information on this topic, and uh, I hope that the people who have attended have uh, really gotten something out of this. And and Stacey, again, thank you very much for your intro. And and obviously, um, the uh, the issue is that we do have an impending uh, uh, timeline that we we need to try and get to. So um, AMPC. Uh, in the process of starting a project in which we're, we're wanting to try and get uh, Des and, and Stacey and myself, whoever we need to, to assist you um, with making a decision when you do decide that you want to join with Meet Messaging so that we can help you through the process and help the uh, vendors, help it work in with your vendors, uh, your, your software vendors, so that we've got the ability to make this thing happen as smoothly as possible. It's a very, very, uh, tight timeline that we've got to do if we want to be ready by the 30th of November. But you know, that's a, that's a challenge that we want to take on and to assist you guys to, uh, to, to transition over so we have the least amount of disruption possible. Uh, are there any last words you'd like to say, Stacey? No, nothing further from, from me, Matt, um, other than just uh, thank you for hosting this today. It is the first point in a lot of communication that we will have coming out to industry. Des, any 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 uh, last famous last words there? Get on and do it. Alrighty, Amanda, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining today's webinar, and a big thank you to Des and Stacey um, for being able to host such and conduct such an informative 
webinar, um, please reach out to anyone that was on the panel today if you want further information and we will endeavour to make the right connections for you. Just a heads up, next Thursday at two o'clock is um, New South Wales time, we'll be holding our next webinar, which will be a COVID update with Dr. Ian Norton. We've also got Amic coming on to talk and give an update on um, the COVID vaccine rollout and also going to present some new tools that AMPC have been creating around COVID. So we look forward to that webinar next week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.